And of course, my camera does not work. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that talking? Oh, I, I am the floating head of doom. That's awesome. Oh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> awesome tech fail, Google. Use your imagination. Use your imagination. I pretty much look the same. Uh, <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. I am your headless host, Nicole Gallucci. <laughs> I will uh, try and futz around with the camera here and, and see if I can figure out what's gone wrong. Uh, it was working just fine a minute ago, of course. Uh, visible on the broadcast are my co-host, Georgia Bracey. Hey, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, Georgia. Uh, and we have our special guest, Anita Heward. Hi. Hello. And we can hear and see you both just fine, which is excellent. Uh, I'd like to say hello to everybody who's up in the comments in the Q&A section. We have a hello from Douglas. Uh, we have a How Is Convergence from Michael Jobin. It was awesome. I can ramble about that um, some other time. Maybe I'll do that <laughs> next week. I don't know. We don't have a show scheduled for next, next week. I can ramble about that or find some video clips. Uh, Guido says, good evening from miserably wet and waterlogged Germany. So sorry to hear that. Sorry and that. hi, everyone, from Nancy Graziano. Uh, so as usual, uh, you know, such as the weeks when you can see me, um, you can comment and interact with us using the Q&A app. Mm -hmm. If you're watching this on YouTube or on Google+, uh, you can watch this um, live and click on the little yellow, I think it's yellow still, banner that says, join the conversation in the Q&A app. Uh, and that will take you to the Q&A app where everybody is chatting and leaving messages. And uh, yeah, Nancy says, I'm going to have to go to George's office. I might do that. Um, mm -hmm. Although it's more, it's yeah, it's easier to drive from, from the one we started with. Um, so yeah, you guys can. Before. What's that? I said we've done that before, though. I've done that before. I have completely bailed. I'm gonna try unplugging and replugging in the camera. If that doesn't work, I will bail and join Georgia next door. <laughs> um, so yeah, join in with questions and comments. Um, this week, uh, like I said, we're talking with Anita he Heward about. Sorry, I keep wanting to say Heward. I don't know why. Uh, some of you may re were, were not as sleep deprived as I was and may remember her from the week from the Hangoutathon. I think I was just heading off to bed as you were arriving. Um, so uh, we are going to talk some about science uh, communication, science journalism, because you have a, 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 a great history with that, and a little bit about the Google Luna X Prize. So maybe you want to start telling us a little bit about your background um, in science and science communication. Okay, so um, it, it was all a bit of an accident, really. Um, I, <laughs> I, I studied uh, <laughs> physics and space science at, at university, um, and then I did a master's in, in Earth observation science, and I was all set to get a proper job, um, analyzing data, um, doing SAR interferometry, and, and being a normal person. Um, <laughs> and then that fell through, and just at that time, um, I was at the University of Leicester, um, and just at that time, they were starting development on um, the National Space Center, which was a millennium project. Um, so this was about 1998. And um, they had kind of like architect's plans, but that was about it um, for this amazing visitor attraction um, all about space, the, the, the first one, the only one in the UK. And so... Um, so I got a part-time job uh, <laughs> working there allegedly for six months, and that kind of turned into three years um, doing all kinds of all kinds of bits and pieces. Um, and it was an amazing training because I, I got to do all kinds of things. I was their curator, so um, I got to put together their collection, and I got to run around the world and um, buy rockets and spacesuits off people, as you do. Um, oh my gosh. And uh, I also set up a, a, a news gallery online, um, and um, I, I, we did a lot of exhibition development and developing interactives and, yeah, doing content for this news site. Um, and so it was, it was an amazing experience, and it kind of gave me a really broad spectrum um, of, of science communication from, you know, direct interaction with the public to working with journalists, working with scientists, um, trying to condense um, black holes down to 150 words um, or, or, you know, um, 
warp speed, what have you. So it, it was a it was a it was a big challenge. Um, but then when Space Center opened, um, it was um, not quite as exciting. Um, so so I left and I went freelance um, using sort of the contacts that I had with the media um, and with the science community and space industry. And I've been I've been doing that pretty much ever since, trying to really sort of promote the UK's and Europe's involvement in space, um, which is and, and mainly in planetary science. Um, and then more recently, I've kind of got to do some fun stuff with the Google Lunar X Prize and um, different kinds of people who are who are now looking to 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 make their own mark in space. Wow, that's a lot of fantastic experience. How much of what you do is is writing versus actually speaking to people in public? Is it a mix or do you lean one way or the other? A lot of it's, a lot of it's writing. Um, so um, a lot of it is, um, I mean, I, I, I have several jobs at the moment. Um, the, the, the Google Lunar X Prize is one, but I also work for Europlanet, which is um, a European network of planetary scientists. So we have Probably more planetary scientists in in Europe than we do than you do in the States, but they're kind of spread by <laughs> across 20 countries and have many languages, and uh, and so uh, trying to sort of bring that community together and get out the message of what they're doing is 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 um, sort of one of my has been one of my main jobs for about eight years now, um, and that is mainly talking to scientists and then sort of writing press releases on presentations that they're doing or papers that they've written. Or submitted to journals, um, and yeah, for the X Prize, it's really just kind of finding out what the teams are doing and and um, and trying to get that get those stories out there. Um, and I also work for the Royal Astronomical Society on their National Astronomy Meeting, which we just had a couple of weeks ago. And again, that's sort of um, finding out what the latest things are um, in astronomy and and getting those stories out to journalists. So it, it's a lot of writing with the occasional visit to schools or <laughs> talking to people just to kind of <laughs> remind myself that there are humans out there. Wow, so when you're thinking about writing something, tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe how you sort of get it together in your mind and how it's different from, you know, basically scientific writing or other types of writing. What particular things, you know, do you try to keep in mind? It's, it's finding that it's finding that way into it. It's finding that sort of initial headline or first sentence that you know. Sometimes you read a paper and maybe it takes you a couple of days to kind of filter it through and filter it through, and then all of a sudden you, it, you something hits you and think, yes, that's the um, that that's the that's the story. That that's the that's the way into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, a lot of what we a lot of what I have to do is kind of reading through a lot of abstracts or a lot of um, a lot of papers um, and trying to work out which are the ones that, that people are going to find interesting, which are the ones that are going to be most appealing. And so, I mean, with that, it, it's quite difficult because a lot of the most important science results are under embargo um, for, you know, the, the, the big journals, so science and nature and um, uh, they ha they have their own regulations and they they, they don't want to know about um, <laughs> meetings and other things going on. So it's not always the big science that we're looking to communicate. A lot of the time, it's sort of things that just generally people might find quite interesting. So um, technology stories generally do quite well. So sort of things like you know designing boats for Titan or um, shields to to radiation shields to protect astronauts um, on on trips to Mars. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of research that 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 goes on that. Sort of has other kind of applications that um, you know maybe a peripheral to the day-to-day -day stuff that the scientists are working on, but it provides kind of a good story or a good hook for for getting into that um, getting into that area of research. Um, and anything with great pictures, great videos. I mean, solar stuff is fantastic at the moment because the imagery is just mm. so amazing um, and really accessible. Whether you um, you know whether you whether you want to know anything about the sun, whether you want to kind of actually delve into how how it's all kind of actually working. Just uh, you know, on a on a level anybody can appreciate um, pictures from solar imagery or or a lot of the planetary stuff too. So I happen to bring my laptop today. Kind of back. 
I happened to bring my laptop today, so I can use that as backup. Oh, what kind of things? So, so I also enjoy bringing. I mean, the 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 uh, the big stories are, are easy to hit, but what do you personally like out of the stories that don't always make the mainstream that you like to bring forth? Um, I I really I mean. There's a, there's a broad spectrum, and, and what a, what is nice to be able to do is to kind of get at least one story kind of representative from each of the each of the branches of science, say covered at a conference. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's so different. I mean, one of the one of the wonderful things about space is that you you get to cover such a broad range of topics, you know, you're really ranging from, from biology over, all the way over to kind of like software engineering and everything in between. So um, what's great is that you, you have that diversity, you have the really visual, really beautiful things that it's really just kind of partly about sort of just saying, look at this image, appreciate the ones of the universe and, and this is what we think is going on behind it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it, it's just been such a, the last 10 years, the last sort of 10, 15 years have just been such a privilege to be involved with um, in planetary science because we've just, it's, it's just been a revolution. You know, I can remember when I was a child and we kind of like had a we just digest atlas that sort of had, you know, hand painted pictures of Saturn. Uh, and that was kind of what we had and that was kind of what we knew. And over the last few years, it, it's just all changed. You know, we've had these amazing missions like Cassini Huygens. Um, actually showing us in detail and over seasons um, what our planetary neighbours are like, um, how they change, how they interact with each other, um, really kind of getting this, this sense that we live in this amazing system that um, all revolves and is in movement all the time and you know we are not kind of here on earth and space is out there, all of it, all of it fits together so all of it, all of it affects each different bit of it. So, you know, we have the sun, we have sunlight. Um, I'm kind of <laughs> wherever I sit at the moment, I see the sun streaming through, and I'm just dazzling. Really. Um, but, um, but yeah, we also have the solar wind that calls aurora, not just here on Earth, um, but also on, you know, on Saturn and Jupiter. We're finding out more and more that there are these amazing similarities between our own planet and these other planets, which sort of at first sight look quite disparate. Um, and, and one of the things that is also really, I, I find really interesting is how we can learn from looking at um, our planetary neighbours to find out more about where we live, um, how that's evolved, um, how that might evolve in the future. So we have a question from Charles Bell uh, asking if you have been uh, writing about or following at all the ISEE3 reboot project. Uh, it, it was a project to um, get back in communication with a spacecraft that's been in orbit near the Earth. Uh, it was called the Interplanetary Comet Explorer Once Upon a Time. Have I, you been following that story at all? I, I, I read an article about um, about it probably yeah probably about a month ago, and um, you know I love that. I love that there's still sort of you know his 70s hardware out there in space that can still be used and can still do stuff, um, and you know that. It's, I, th I think it's being used for a sort of citizen science project mm -hmm. now, and I think that's that's another really um, amazing and interesting uh, development over the past few years. That now science um, and space and missions aren't the prerogative of, of just governments or universities or academic bodies, um, but actually anybody can be involved. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have the interest, if you if you have the time, um, then you can. You can do research. You can talk to satellites. You can build your own satellite and get that launched. Um, you can analyze all kinds of data from well, the, the the moon and, and galaxies and and all kinds of things. And I mean, the democratization of space, I think, is is such a fantastic development and looks as though it's going to get even more exciting over the next few years. So you've um, had experience with press releases and outreach and writing articles. Um, how do you see them all being connected to each other? What, how is each one different or part of a bigger process? It, I mean, it, it's, I've sort of got to the point now where I've been doing this, um, well, more than 10 years anyway, um, 
and and so you do get sort of get a real sense of the sort of incremental process of science. You know, every now and then you get a big breakthrough and and something really exciting happens. You have a mission that gets somewhere and you you see things in a completely different light. But um, so much of what science is and how science works is a sort of incremental building on uh, we knew this before and now we've got this new bit of information which kind of clarifies that a bit a bit better and it's um, it, it's quite difficult from a news perspective to to you know to, to really bring that out because you know if you've kind of got two-thirds of the picture um, then getting that extra third isn't necessarily news but I mean that is potentially a lot of work that's gone into it um, and a lot of government funding that's been spent on it potentially um, and so it still is something that there should be we, we should be talking about we should we should find ways of communicating um, and I think you know the, the 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 other great development of the last few years is things like this Google Hangout mm -hmm. um, which means that and, and Twitter and Facebook and uh, all kinds of social media things which means that um, there are many many more options um, for how science can be communicated but it doesn't just have to be news it doesn't have to be something which is going to get on you know into the, the national newspapers or um, you know on TV or on radio it, it can be it can be just a scientist kind of you know talking to you guys and, and telling telling you about what it is that they do why they're doing it why they love it um, and so I, I think that spectrum is 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 a really good toolbox now that we have um, to, to communicate all kinds of different stories and different bits of information in in different ways. I mean, the media is not going to go away. We're still going to have, you know, the, there's still a need for press releases. There still is that channel that, that works, but now it's kind of supplemented by all these, all these other different things. Do you find in the last few years or recently or maybe with the improvement of these technologies that um, there has been an increase in interest in these scientific stories, or an increase in the audience, or something, or, or is it just that we're better, uh, the technology is better for reaching people? Sorry, I'm just, I'm just gonna. The <laughs> sun is sure. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very privileged. I'm down in Cornwall at the moment, which is one of the nicest bits of the UK. But, um, um, and I, I shouldn't ever. As a British person, complain about sunny days. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just at the moment, lights <laughs> lights cause me a bit of a problem. Never complain um, about having a window either. Yeah. Yeah, we had basement offices before this. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always good to have. It's always good to see some kind of daylight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's been a it's been an interesting few years in in terms of gen journalism and how that works. I mean, when I first started it was very much that you put out a press release and there would be lots of interest from national newspapers, well if you were lucky, um, and local radio perhaps, and you know, the phone would ring, the landline phone would ring, and um, you, 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 know, you would go and talk to the journalist or you'd have to go and find somebody and bring them physically to go and um, use the phone or go and sit down and have an interview with the scientist. And that doesn't happen anymore. There's been a lot of consolidation in um, uh, in newspapers, um, in um, broadcasters. You know, I mean, the BBC used to have many, many, many different groups of journalists who would who would work on different bits, and that's kind of all been condensed down. And there are a lot less science journalists around. And so, you know, I have noticed that the the pickup from those sort of traditional channels. It has got more difficult. It's, it's more difficult for me to get a story now into, you know, into the national newspaper than maybe it was ten years ago. On the other hand, um, with the internet, um, you know, we, we we find our stories picked up all over the world in all kinds of languages. So, you know, you you you, you see a story that you put out in Portsmouth in the UK, and it's picked up in India, in China, in um, Lithuania, in um, in in Brazil, who knows where? So it, it it's changed, and in some ways it's got more difficult. And in some ways, it's opened up a whole new a whole new spectrum of places where you 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 can get a story out to. So it's um, 
it's it's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It's just just changing and 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 different. Yeah. So it's a lot of fast moving change to adapt to, I'm sure as well. And um, I'm interested in what are the more difficult parts of your job? Um, often the difficult thing is getting the information out of people. Um, so um, the interview or the just however you do it, the questioning. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think we still things things are better, things are improving, but I think there is still a sense amongst some scientists, not all scientists, but some scientists, that outreach is something that it, it's 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 a distraction. It's something that they don't really need to do. It's something that they uh, don't see why they have to waste their time doing. Um, and so. And it, it's kind of low on their low on their list of priorities, and so mm -hmm. um, trying to trying to engage with with people to make sure that they um, they actually tell people mm -hmm. who pay for what they do basically yeah. about what it is that they're doing mm -hmm. um, can still be can still be a bit of a challenge. Um, I mean, it, uh, thing things are things are changing. Things have been changing. Um, uh, with Europlanet, we've run lots of training courses to to um, help um, the science community sort of um, understand what it is journalists want from them, um, who it is they're talking to, how that information gets translated, and I think you know a lot of it is just understanding the process and understanding what people want out of it. Um, but it, it it's still not. It's still not perfect. It's still always, always a bit of a fight. I mean, at the moment, we're we're just putting together. Um, in Europe, we have this um, this funding program from the European Commission called Horizon 2020, um, which is 84 billion euros, I think, of funding over the next five or so years. Anyway, basically, kind of taking us up towards 2020, hence the name. And um, I'm involved in various. Bids um, to do the outreach part of those, and you know, it's it's always a fight. We always have to kind of, you know, <laughs> fight quite fiercely to kind of get that outreach bit in there, make sure that it's kind of there at a significant level, and make sure that the people that we have there doing that work are professionals. It's not something that you know you can just get your postdoc or your your PhD student to do. You actually do need um, people who have those skills, that experience to to do the job in their professional way, and. You know, I mean, particularly with things like social media, you, you you need to have people who know what they're doing and, and know how best to um, to apply those platforms. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing battle, but you know, it's <laughs> we survive. So you work with scientists to help them, I guess, understand why they should uh, talk to you, right? Then and how they should communicate to the press. Do you also help them learn to be better communicators themselves, or is it more through you as the communicator? I, I think I think there is an element of, of inter scientist um, communication as well. I mean, particularly you know back to back to back to Europlanet. I mean, just making sure that all the different parts of the project, all these people who are working on, you know, that we, we have. All these activities, like going out to planetary analog sites, um, we have workshops where people identify science goals. We have um, people having access to sort of state-of-the-art facilities in 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 other countries. And um, every now and then, we sort of have a big meeting, and everybody goes, "Oh, I, I had no idea that you <laughs> that that was available, or, or that um, you, you've got these results, or that this has happened." And um, yeah, that that sort of Joining up of the community, I and mean, particularly as I say in Europe, where we have many different countries and many different cultures and many different languages, um, it, it is it, that that inter scientist communication um, is really important, and we haven't really nailed the best way of doing that. I mean, there are you know there are newsletters that go out by email, but people don't necessarily read them, um, and it, it's it, it's hard to know how. How to do that effectively? But I mean, I think that is without that, without that internal communication working really well. Um, and you know, I, I don't think this is a European problem. I think this is a pretty much every organisation that I've ever worked in problem. Um, is um, 
without that internal communication, then it, it's really difficult to to actually get the message out to anybody else in a sensible, coherent kind of way. Yeah. So we, we have a couple of comments. Uh, Guido Bibra points out, uh, since someone had mentioned ISEE3, uh, they're making another try at firing the thrusters right now. Uh, so you can follow the Twitter feed there, uh, ISEE3 reboot, to check that out. Um, and then uh, Michael Jobin wanted to ask, what are what groups are you currently working with right now, or what sites are you writing for? So what are the projects that, that have you uh, occupied right at the moment? Um, so my my main occupation at the moment is the Google Lunar X Prize, mm -hmm. um, which um, I don't know whether everybody knows what that is, um, but please it's, tell, please tell. We love to hear about it. <laughs> it's a it's a competition to land a robot on the moon. It's the competition for the first commercial organisation to land a robot on the moon, um, and we have eighteen teams competing at the moment, and they have to build their robot. They have to land it on the moon, have it travel five hundred meters and send back high-definition video and imagery. And they have to complete all that um, by the end of 2015. So <laughs> they've, got, they've got a lot of work to do um, oh. <laughs> in, the next, in the next uh, 18 months. Um, and then aside from that main challenge, there are sort of various other challenges that they can do, like going and imaging the Apollo Heritage site. So um, getting, that, getting that hard evidence that um, people have been there to the moon um, showing um, not just not just the American, not just the Apollo sites, but also sort of Lunacod rovers potentially oh, um, cool. as a prize for um, uh, identifying water, um, detecting water on the moon. There is a prize for surviving the the lunar night, um, and so you know it's it's a, it's a really interesting competition because it involves all kinds of groups that come from. A huge spectrum of, of backgrounds. It's not just kind of your usual space scientists and engineers. That um, you know, they, they need those people, but they uh, the, the the motivation is is, is quite diverse, um, and just the potential opportunities for that for opening up um, access, cheap access, cheap reliable day to day access to the moon um, is. Um, you know, it's a is a tremendously exciting it's an exciting thing. Um, it's got implications for um, for all of us really. So so that's kind of that's kind of the day job or one of the day jobs. Um, the other day job at the moment is um, writing these proposals for Europlanet and for a couple of other consortia. Um, and what else? Um, yeah, just the the, the the national astronomy meeting, but that's gone now, so I don't have to worry about that for another year. So I mean, most of it most of it is is kind of doing the um, the, the the connection bit really between between the scientists or the engineers or the team or whoever it is and and the public. I, I don't do much, you know, writing journalism um, specific articles at the moment, but who knows in the future. <laughs> Um, we have another question from Sylvan Westby. Uh, I don't, uh, recently, the BBC has asked their journalists not to invite people on their programs, uh, the fringe or, or unscientific, pseudoscientific views when discussing things such as climate change. Um, do you have uh, an opinion on, on that particular, um, I don't know what to call it, decision, decision on the, on the side of BBC? Um, I, I mean, the BBC um, plays a has a has a role in all of our hearts in the UK, um, and we would like it to, um, you know, I, I it has a reputation or has had a reputation for many years um, in providing very high quality journalism. Um, I hope that it will continue to do that. Um, I mean. It, it has, as a public broadcaster, it has a responsibility to provide balance um, when discussing any issue. Um, obviously, with um, things like climate change, it's um, it's a contentious issue, and um, getting the representative um, view from the science community um, and balancing that with um, political issues. Um, <laughs> you go ahead and say it's a false balance. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, obviously, 
community as a science communicator, my I would like to see. I would like to make sure that the science is yeah. the science as we understand it, the science as we know it is is properly represented and pro properly yes. properly communicated. Um, I, I don't I don't quite know what the um, what what the BBC guidelines are, but I mean I I, I hope very much that that kind of okay. thing uphold us. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't know how much this is prevalent in in European media, but in the U.S., there's a a, a very strong um, push towards journalism being balanced, and that means showing both sides. The problem is one side may have been shown to be quite wrong, especially in these scientific cases. So the BBC is saying, "No, we're done showing. Um, we're done Sorry. talking about." Hello. Oh, she's just here. <laughs> I heard a horn of some sort. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was my, my phone suddenly started ringing. So. Oh, anyway. oh, okay. I'm like, there's a horn outside. Um, but anyway, I think I think it's a good I think it's a good step in, in that we're going to you know to talk about you can talk about both sides of a policy debate. That's fine. But uh, you know, t talking about science that's and, and pseudoscience and trying to balance them against each other is, is a tricky thing. And so I'm 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 pretty happy they've taken that step. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a couple other. Uh, is this Europlanet slash EU dot org? Is that the main website for Europlanet? Yes. Okay. Uh, cool. Thank you, Charles. So I will share that out. I am scattered right now, but I will share that in the comments and in the just show description after the show, as well as the uh, show notes for the audio version. Um, uh, Adam Synergy says, uh, "You know, when you see someone, you think, I think I know this person somehow." <laughs> He was uh, at, at at Leicester University in the biological sciences building at the same time you were there. Oh, oh right, sorry, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so hello. Um, uh, Michael Jobin adds large publications are important to getting to the masses, um, whereas niche readers are the choir. So that's you know the the small the science sites specifically, but web writing is good. Um, and Charles was wondering what your thoughts are on the Rosetta mission as it's heading towards Comet 67P. I'm not going to try and pronounce the rest of that. Sherry <laughs> Mokrasmenko. Wow, can you do that again? Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I think the Rosetta mission is so exciting. Um, it's um, I've been following it since well, since before it before it launched, um, and you know after. After a ten-year journey of of winding up round the Earth and round Mars, we're we're finally there. It's sort of actually starting to come into focus. I think it's what the, the last year it was five pixels, um, and you can you can see the nucleus sort of tumbling around, um, and it's you know it, it it's it, it's it's so nice that um, it, it makes me makes me proud of my space agency. I, I mean. Uh, the European Space Agency started off in planetary missions with with Giotto, um, with the Giotto flyby, which um, happened when I was I don't know about ten, twelve, something like that. And you know, it's really nice to see it come of age, the 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 the, the planetary program come of age with this very complex mission that will really tell us a lot of new things about about comets. And comets are so. Um, you know, they're, they're such a fascinating time capsule of all kinds of things in, in the solar system, allowing us to kind of look back at um, what was there when the solar system formed, but um, also sort of answering questions about, you know, where our water comes from um, and where um, where organic material comes from on Earth. Um, so it's it's a it, it's a tremendously exciting mission and um, yeah the orbiter is is getting there um, really soon isn't it um, it's uh, sort of so slowly winding itself into orbit around um, around the nucleus um, over the summer and then um, the decision will be made where the little lander is going to dock um, with this uh, with the nucleus. Um, in the in the autumn in November, so it's going to be a fantastic few months, and um, I wish all of the all of the teams, uh, instrument teams and the mission team very well. And um, you know you can see the dedication from the 
um, from the project scientist Matt Taylor who had a tattoo of Rosetta oh uh, on his leg. So um, he, he's he's with it for life. That's excellent. That's excellent. Um, <laughs> so what? Is, so how is the media going to deal with trying to pronounce Churyumov Gerasimenko? <laughs> Can you say it again? Gerasimenko. <laughs> I think they're just going to talk about the comet. Um, <laughs> or, P, um, or Comet CG, who knows? Um, okay. They're, they're going to have to find a way of, of dealing with it. Or, or maybe it just will be one of those things that by the end of it, everybody will know. Um, everybody will practice. It will be kind of like a practice, 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 <laughs> practice, practice. practice, practice. Oh my wow. Anita, do you often go to schools? I don't know if I thought I heard you say that or interact you know, with public audiences of different ages and things like that. Is that I, kind of anything that you like to do? I, I wouldn't say that I often go now, but I do try to go every now and then. Um, I, I was at a schools event um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I recently became a trustee of a, of a learning chari a space Link learning foundation. It's charity, and mm -hmm. um, we we had a um, a day where we had a, a hundred um, kids from the local area who came and did all kinds of activities and had Q and A's with. Um, speakers and, and things so it, it's it's nice every now and I mean I, I I think it's really important every now and then just to go and to do that to um, occasionally sort of go and talk to um, groups I have been to talk to my mum's WI or <laughs> something like that it, it's it's just nice to kind of balance yourself back in the real world because I mean otherwise you you, you get you get in your little clique you get in your your group of um, uh, of people who, who and you, you partly um, get locked into the jargon. You think that everybody knows what you're going on about, and obviously they 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 don't. But also, I think it, it's also really important to go and talk to people who are, you know, maybe impressed and enthralled and um, excited about things that you can get quite quite blasé about. Um, mm -hmm. And so, it's um, yeah, I, I like to go and. Talk to people, um, or have people talk to me. <laughs> Every now and then, that that was really great. Um, it was a huge, huge mix of people um, from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of countries. And yeah, it's it's nice to hear, and nice to hear what other people are doing. Nice to hear what other scientists are doing who are, you know, studying all kinds of different different fields of, you know, biomedicine or robotics or. You know, other bits and pieces. It, it's also it's also good to kind of keep on top of those kind of things too. Really fascinating. Yeah. Hmm. Do you have a favorite? Um, uh, yeah, I know you said you, you like to focus on planetary science. Do you have a favorite uh, story or or scientific um, finding that's come out recently uh, that that uh, you'd like to share? Um. Um, what's the most exciting thing we've had recently? Um, we uh, uh, at at the National Astronomy Meeting. In fact, actually, at the National Astronomy Meeting last week, we were we were talking about um, uh, sort of future visions. We were talking about the successor to the James Webb Telescope, um, and you know, the James Webb Telescope is is huge, and it's got you know, you watch those videos of the whole thing unfurling in this amazing <laughs> kind of way. Um, <laughs> And um, you know the, the potential from that is amazing. Um, but you know the successor to that, which I think they, they call at last. I can't remember what the I can't remember what the the acronym um, acronym um, what's the word uh, anyway acronym acronym okay acronym yes. um, <laughs> I can't remember what it stands for. But um, you know for that they're talking about something that's actually going to be built in orbit. Um, and have this, you know, enormous great mirror, and be able to do all these amazing things, and then get to the center of the point. So, I mean, you know, what what is what never fails to amaze me is the ambition that people have. You know, we we, we kind of do stuff, and a lot of science is incremental, and a lot of missions are kind of, you know, one step and another step and another little step. But you know, there are also these 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 big big visions um, for astronomy. It would be nice if we could also have some big visions of planetary science. I would like to see, you know, some stories properly um, about going back to the moon or, you know, going, preparing to go to Mars. I mean, at the moment, I, ESA certainly um, is um, in a bit of a hiatus um, for, for lunar programs and uh, NASA won't 
talk about the moon at all, really, at the moment, apart from asteroids and orbits around them. So um, it, it would be, <laughs> it would be as a, as somebody that spends a lot of the time thinking about the moon, um, it would be nice to kind of, uh, it would be nice to hear some stories about that yes. um, from a from a grand vision point of view. Well, we, we have spacecraft at the moon now because the last administration was all about it. And then we switched because, you know, spacecraft timelines are, are now going to be much longer than, than um, presidential administrations in the U.S. <laughs> so that, that definitely makes makes an issue. Um, what? Oh, we have a question from Charles. What do you tell people when the subject of Pluto comes up, as it still does many years later, uh, after that IAU decision, um, when Pluto comes up and the New Horizons mission comes up, and do you get questions about Pluto being a planet versus a dwarf planet? Yes, um, and it is, with the description that we have from the IAU, it is quite complicated to explain that. I mean, I think, sort of within the context of planetary science, um, what we tend to do is kind of more talk about the kinds of things that there are in the solar system, and so you know, I mean, the, the, the term planet is all, it's almost a, it's sort of a historical yeah. um, term almost, and it doesn't necessarily mean anything, and that we have, you know, we have terrestrial planets um, like the Earth and Venus and Mars, but I mean, then again, Titan has a lot of um, things in common, um, or, or Europa or Ganymede, with, with, with our kind of planets, um, and so it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to, to get too kind of fixated on what goes around the sun and how it goes around the sun and whether it's good as orbit or, or, or what have you. It, it's more about um, recognizing that there are all these different kinds of really interesting things. Um, and because Pluto's been demoted technically as a, as a dwarf planet, it doesn't make it any, any less interesting. Um, and you know, the more we seem to be finding about the, these icy worlds, um, that uh, that have seasons, and they have, you know they they are um, they are a very interesting area to research, and you know we're we're really looking forward to New Horizons and actually seeing um, in a lot more detail about what's there. It'd be fantastic to have something better than sort of those little fuzzy, fuzzy blobs that you need to sort of have when you're doing your family portrait of the solar system. It would be. It, I, I can't wait to actually have um, proper proper pictures, proper maps. Um, and as we found from missions like um, like Cassini, um, and as it's been taking a look at all of Saturn's moons, um, all of those have thrown up all kinds of amazing surprises. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot there's a lot of interesting stuff in the solar system. Um, and uh, whatever you call it, it's it's interesting to somebody, um, and hopefully will be interesting to everybody once we once we actually see what's there. I love it. Yeah, 2015 is going to be amazing. Between uh, Dawn getting to Ceres and and New Horizons getting to Pluto, we're going to get all the dwarf planet goodness, uh, and we'll be pretty excited. So I I'm I'm thrilled to look forward to that <laughs> in my lifetime. Um, I had another question and I just went blank. Oh, do you have any um? This is partly self-serving, but do you have any advice for uh, science communicators entering the field now? People who either writing or science background or both, or um, people who want to tell the tales of science, uh, use these different media outlets um, to do so. Do you have any advice for people who are just starting out? Yeah, I mean, first of all, first of all, it's possible. It's possible to make a, a career and a living out of doing science communication, um, I've managed to do that um, and it's managed to keep me going, um, you know, not in not in grand style, but um, uh, <laughs> giving up anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I, I think what, what's, what's good about it is it's a small world um, in terms of the number of people who are involved. It, it sort of is one of those fields where everybody does tend to know everybody after a while. And if you can find yourself a niche, mm -hmm. um, then um, it, it works out quite. It can work out quite well as a lot of word of mouth. But you know, you work with somebody, and then somebody else is looking for somebody who um, who um, who's looking for the skill sets that you have. 
Um, and the other brilliant thing about it is that it is a global world, um, a global community. And so, you know, you don't necessarily have to work for somebody within commuting distance um, of, of where you are or where you live. Um, you, you can end up working, you know, I, I work partly with people in LA um, and the rest of the world and um, partly with sort of maybe people based in Paris or Bremen or, or where have you. So it's, it, what's fantastic about it is that it's a really global mix of people. Um, there are a lot of opportunities out there. I think there are, particularly now, um, a lot of opportunities in that, as I was saying, I mean, social media has suddenly come from nowhere when we were writing the, the last year of Planet Proposal. Um, social media wasn't there, you know, I mean, we didn't even consider it. It was, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, it just, it just didn't kind of factor in and sort of, you know, halfway into the project we suddenly had to kind of try and learn on the job. Um, but now there are a lot of people out there like yourselves who, who you know, who really know what, what you're doing, um, know how to use these tools um, in, in the right way. And I think if you, if you have that, um, then um, if you have that experience, if you have that enthusiasm, um, then I think there are a lot of opportunities out there. Um, but also, you know, I mean, the, the traditional stuff doesn't go away either. There are still um, institutions and people that need press officers. There are still um, astronomy magazines that need writers. There are, um, yeah, there, there, are, there are lots of opportunities for, for, for doing things. What about advice for educators uh, who don't have much time, but they want to share the resource, uh, they want to share the latest space news, they want to share the latest science news with their students. Um, what are some good resources for them to keep up with what's going on? Um, okay, so um, we, um, there's a project called UNARWE, um, which is Universal Awareness, I think, um, yep. and they have this, um, they have this great thing called Space Scoop, um, where they take press releases from um, organizations like UBIS, Southern Observatory, Observatory, from ESA, from the Royal Astronomical Society, all kinds of places, and they will write that in a way that's accessible to kids um, with the right kind of imagery, and they have all kinds of resources there. So, so they're really great. Um, there are many, many, many teacher training programs out there, like the Galileo Teacher Training Program um, with wonderful, enthusiastic people who will um, be able to point you in the direction of a lot of resources. Um, there's my, my husband's project, which is the Fulks Telescope um, project, which um, you, you can log on um, from um, from your classroom during, um, during school hours in the UK or in European time zones, and um, you can choose what you want to look at and you can make your own observations. And so in that sense, you're kind of um, making the making the news, seeing things yourself. I mean, they, they have a lot of programs where they work with, um, with scientists to, to track specific objects, so looking for asteroids and, and, and what have you. Um, I don't know. I mean, there, there are just so many resources out there. It's always really, it's always really hard, and, and, and that's, that's always a big problem, is actually trying to work out where to point people to get the best stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's a platform recently launched called Astro Edu, mm -hmm. um, which aims to collate activities and get them peer reviewed by teachers so that they can um, they can kind of um, highlight the, the, the ones that people really find effective um, and endorse ones that really work, which is, I think, a really good initiative. Um, and otherwise, you know, ESA, well, with Rosetta, I mean, ESA have been putting together all kinds of um, activities and apps and uh, things so that you can see where Rosetta is and what it's doing and, and how it's going to um, interact with its comet and they've started doing a series, I think their own series, Google Hangouts and so um, that's a good way of finding out what, what the teams are doing. Um, so yes, there, there's, there's lots of things out there and NASA always have a plethora of things obviously but yeah. Yeah, Space Scoop is, is a favorite of mine. We occasionally uh, have some of uh, one of our podcasters read the Space Scoop press releases as a uh, one of our podcasts for 365 Days of Astronomy. Um, and, I, and I think Pamela actually did a demonstration at Balticon where she read side by side 
a press release from an organization and the Space Scoop version of the press release, and all the adults in the room would rather read the Space Scoop <laughs> version <laughs> right off the bat um, because it, it is, uh, it, they, they're really careful to pick apart the jargon and, and use words that most people would know, which, I mean, it's, it's originally, I, I forget what actual reading level it's set for, so children can read it, um, but that's really helpful for adults, too, because they don't always know all the jargon. Yeah, absolutely. The space group is definitely a favorite project of, of ours. Awesome. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, we <laughs> have a, a couple of comments on what we've talked about, um, including uh, the Twitter handle for Euro Europlanet is Europlanet Media. I, is that correct? Anita? Yeah. Anita, how much social media do you personally do? I'm just curious if you've kind of embraced <laughs> the Twitter and the, the Facebook and... Not, not, you, quite, not, not too much, much real, as you will see from my, from my Europlanet media. It, 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 it's, it's kind of a bit... Um, half heart is the wrong word, but um, it's... I, I find it quite hard to, um, to do it, you know, it's just trying to fit everything in um, and trying to, trying to do everything that you need to do and I think, you know, for instance, if you're at a conference, um, it's quite hard to tweet during the sessions unless you're really good to, to kind of condense everything down to 140 characters. I find that, you know, by the time that I've done that, I've kind of missed the next 15 minutes of, of what people have said, so... Um, move on, right. I, I think there are, you know, as I say, there, there are loads of people out there that, that have those skills and have that, that talent and, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite happy to let them, <laughs> let them do that. Um, and I, I, I understand, I think it's really important. I, I think that organisations um, need to use that. Um, it, it's become such a, such a great way of, you know, it, it, it's an opportunity to communicate directly with people, which is... Mm -hmm. Um, which is something that we didn't really have sort of 10 years ago and you know with, with Twitter with sort of retweets you can reach you know not with every tweet but every now and then you reach such a diverse group of people um, yeah. but yeah it's, 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 it's not really something I'm particularly good at myself <laughs> Oh, I'm kind of with you there. I'm not that great at it, and it's it doesn't seem really natural to me. But it's amazing, yeah, the people that do do it well, and how you can get information real time is just um, it's an amazing part mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of communication these days. So, uh, Guido points out that uh, the greatest thing of today's internet age is that we can all follow these missions basically in real time. And that, that's yeah. a lot, what a lot of good of, uh, of the Twitter accounts are for. But it still takes communicators like Anita to make them really interesting for everyone. So thank you, Guido. We <laughs> try. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I, sorry, I was just going to say. I mean, I, I think there is the, the the other brilliant thing about social media and and this kind of immediacy that that people have come to kind of think of as normal um, means that there is now a lot of pressure on um, on scientists to to talk about what they're doing so that it's not kind of a case of they store up all their, all their results for two years until they can, you know, have a special edition in science or nature or whatever. Um, and then you kind of find out everything. Um, there, is, uh, there is a much, much more, uh, there's, a, there's a much better sense that, that they need to share, um, missions need to share what they're doing on a much more regular basis. And so it, it's, um, you get a much better sense of sort of that that day to day process of science rather than just sort of right. oh we've discovered this and yeah. it's wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd like thank to end with a bit of business. Uh, first of all, well, we had a, a comment from Michael wondering uh, if Georgia had been to Convergence, and Georgia did not go to Convergence. <laughs> I know, yeah. But as as a big sci-fi fan, have you? Because you, I don't think we've been to any cons together. Have you been to any science? No, I was going to say I saw that comment. <laughs> not to get too off track, but um, no, I have never been to a con. Well, we need to fix that. So that's just on my list of things to do someday. But um, yes, I love sci-fi and all that. I would have a blast. I'm sure. Um, Maybe be completely overwhelmed and have to go okay, hide in the corner we somewhere. But, we won't take um, you to Dragon Con as your first con because yeah. I did that and that was wow. Yeah, but it's it's becoming more and more of a, of a great place to do science outreach. Yeah, yeah, that's the really cool thing about it is you get the science part and you can have the sci-fi part and have a whole lot of fun. Yeah. 
reach Definitely. all kinds of people that way. So Definitely. Yeah, um, I'll go someday. Yay, yes, we will we will get you to a con. We'll start local. We'll start maybe we'll start local. Um, we have next week we are taking off from the live show as uh, we've got travel and things happening. Um, I I'm gonna try and get a video up for next Wednesday for something for you. I'm probably gonna poke at my friends who are at conventions and see if they have any any good video or audio content they'd be happy to share with Learning Space. Uh, I know there's a bit out there. I didn't take much video myself uh, as I was running from panel to panel. Um, but we'll try and get some kind of video content up there by Wednesday for you to enjoy. But next week there'll be no live show for Learning Space. Um, Astronomy Cast, as, as Guido, Guido pointed out, put, posted on Google Plus the listing of all the space hangouts happening on Google Plus, which is amazing. And I'll have to dig that back out of my email uh, and share that in the show notes as well. Uh, Learning, space, uh, the Learning Space will be on hiatus for one week. Astronomy Cast is on hiatus for the summer. Uh, Weekly Space Hangouts on hiatus for the summer, <laughs> um, and Virtual Star Parties on a monthly format. It looks like they're doing the first Sunday of every month as their um, as their show time. Uh, so I will be adding that to our to our regular schedule. Um, but I will put the link to Guido's post because he, he lists all the upcoming Deep Astronomy Hangouts and the Hubble News Hangouts and all the other fun places you can get your space stuff. Um, and I will be will be back in two weeks. We'll be talking with uh, Michelle Prisby of University of Virginia about uh, bringing science outreach from the university to the community, since uh, that is something she is spearheading over at University of Virginia. Um, she started uh, after I left, unfortunately, so I didn't get to work with her directly. Uh, but that'll be a a fun conversation there. Um, Nancy says you should come to Geek Girl Con, Georgia. <laughs> Woohoo! Seattle, October, we're going. <laughs> All right, maybe you never know. I could shock everybody and just show up. Be fun. We have a science. We have a do-it-yourself science zone. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you, India, uh, so much. Maybe you want to uh, share a few places people can find you in your work uh, or or contact you. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any places people could? Uh, See your work or contact you, like. Um, yes, you you can you can find me all over the place. Um, I mean, if if you Google me, I mean, uh, um, my my contact details I think are, I think are all over the place. Um, okay. But uh, you you can you can contact me through Europlanet Media, uh, Twitter, or you you can find my contact details online or through XPRIZE or okay. wherever. Great, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you everybody for joining us on your rainy. Or hot and humid days. Uh, <laughs> this, that was it for Learning Space. We'll see you guys in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. Bye.